Okay, this is lecture two um, in the series for our Automated Systems Robotics uh, Introduction to PLCs. Again, I'm E.J. Daigle, Dean of Robotics and Manufacturing here at Dunwoody College. And tonight, or today, rather, we'll talk about uh, the basics of PLC programming. The first thing I want to talk about is the kind of the standard programming languages that you'll see in the world of PLCs. Um, the PLC is becoming a lot like the PC in that we see more and more programming languages come on board as time goes on. Um, by far, the one that you're going to want to equate yourself with the most is ladder logic. Um, first, first reason why is because it is the most common programming language in the United States. Um, but second off, it, 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 is, it is a fairly easy jump from, for anyone that has uh, some basic electricity knowledge in their background because it was developed from the uh, electromechanical schematic symbols that we use in relay logic. Um, so when you see ladder logic, it is kind of what you what you'd uh, describe here. We have we have rungs of a ladder that would look like this in ladder logic. And what you're going to see is you're going to see bits, um, you know, and, and typically these bits on this side, these are going to be your inputs as we're looking at ladder logic. Um, on this side, we'll have our output instructions. You know, so if I just use some very, very basic, uh, what I call pseudocode here, if this is input one and input two, and then let's say this is output one, I might also have output one turning something else on. Um, in addition to seeing outputs on this side, the other thing that you'll see on this side is you'll sometimes see um, what I call box instructions. Um, you might see something like an on delay timer, a TON uh, that we're gonna use to turn something on. So. It, it really does resemble that of what we would call a, a uh, you know, very similar model to what we would, we'd see in, in uh, ladder logic, relay logic, or uh, relay logic schematic diagrams. Um, in addition to program, or excuse me, in addition to ladder logic, we also have something called function block diagram. You know, and if you looked at this in ladder logic, we might say, well, these two, these two inputs in series, we'll call these guys an AND gate. So if I get I1 and I2, I get Q1. The neat thing about function block diagram is that function block programming uses block structures to represent inputs, outputs, or commonly used logic gates. Um, so it's not uncommon for us to have a logic gate um, that just has the big, the big and symbol on it like this. And it might be that um, input one goes to here and input two goes to here um, and it could be that uh, I'll make that input to that equals output one q1 so a lot of times people it's, it's people struggle to get used to function block diagram um, because they kind of float in space you know we're not connected to a rail um, we're kind of floating in space as to what happens here um, but for those of you that might have some digital electronics or programming background in like LabVIEW or uh, any type of graphical programming language, this tends to make a lot of sense. And, and where ladder is more common in the United States, we'll see a lot of function block diagram in place in Europe, places like Germany and um, uh, other places in Europe, the UK and things like that. And then we have, uh, um, you know, I'm calling the statement list. This is one of the ones that I'm I'm most concerned with, but but really all of your structured text type programming languages. Um, you know, when we look at structured text programming languages, um, let me keep this on here for a second here, and just all right. So sorry about that. I'm back now. Um, what I was going into here was statement list programming it would be similar to your your textual based programming languages. Um, you know, one of my first languages I learned was Java. You know, an object-oriented programming language where different sequences of syntax or, or text meant something. Or if I go way back, actually my first programming language was basic on an IBM PC. Um, but in statement list, we have statements that mean something. So if we go back to that AND gate example, um, that AND gate example in, in ladder looked like this. We had input one and we had input two and that gave us output one, Q1. And in function block diagram, we had this, where we had, uh, we had input one, and we had input two, 
and those went to an actual block that we, we drew with the AND gate symbol here. I always screw that one up there. There we go. And that equaled Q1. When we go into statement list or some of our other textual based programming languages, it'll mainly be text that you'll be looking at. Um, so as an example, we might have load input one and then we'll have an, an A or an AND or something like that. So AND input two and that's going to equal output one. You know, and this would be a logical AND gate. Um, in statement lists, we might have load input one or input two equals output one. So you see a couple examples of statement list here. So the syntax is, is very important here, but it's, it's really not that bad to pick up because you can actually use your, your help menus just like you would for any instruction you don't know in ladder or function block diagram. So those help menus are going to come in very, very handy. Um, so when we talk about PLC applications, there are, there are two main applications that we break down into. Um, the first one I would call is machine control. And I won't call this, you know, it's, it's not dumb. It's not, uh, it's not lesser than process control. But what I mean when I say machine control, this would be something like a, uh, uh, you know, the, the PLC, uh, pardon me, there we go. The PLC responds to user inputs. To control a machine to control a machine um, and and you know the best example that I could give is you know maybe I have a oh as an you know car wash could be a machine control um, you know it could be something you know an elevator an elevator could be a machine control a car wash could be a machine control um, you know where, where both these examples the user starts or something as simple as a motor control you know, I want to turn something on and off in reverse direction. I can turn it on. I can turn it off. I can, you know, run it forward. I can run it reverse. Um, I might be able to control the speed. Um, but in all of these instances, these are these are all predefined things, uh, meaning that the elevator, I hit a button, it goes to that floor. It opens the doors. The car wash, I type in a code. It uh, opens the garage door. I pull my car in and it washes the car and I drive out. Um, the mo motor control I hit on turns on, I hit off, it turns off, I hit forward, it goes forward, I hit reverse, it goes reverse, and if I type in the speed, maybe it goes to speed. Process control would be different. Um, we, we have, uh, in process control, you know, I think about process control more like uh, uh, where we, we have variables, you know, variables that are beyond our control, um, beyond user control that we want to automatically account for. So we want to automatically account for those. You know, the, the, the best example I can give of that, um, you know, is, is if you went to, let's say, uh, you know, where they're making Coca-Cola or if you're a, you know, a, you know, a beer drinker or root beer drinker or whatever it is, um, the, the brewing process, you know, there's variables that are going to be very important to us, temperature, uh, pressure, humidity you know all of these things are going to be very very important um or uh you know I, you could almost think of it even like a uh you think about it like the cruise control in your car you know that's an example that i think others would understand here um it's easy to set the cruise control or you know machine control in your car is i, I go or i stop right you know i could go i could go i could stop i could go forward or reverse um you know, and have user control of that. But if I set the cruise control at 55 miles per hour, the expectation expectation is that the car is going to be maintained at 55 miles per hour, regardless of what happens. Well, what that means is if my car is, you know, traveling down the interstate here, right? And I've got my car and I'm traveling down the interstate. What happens when I hit a hill going up? Well, now that I go up, the, the process needs to adjust for that. And it may need to accelerate without without the user being involved and when i go down it may have to coast without the user being involved so process control this is where we'll see things like pid algorithms we'll see temperature pressure humidity all of these variables these uh these these process controls or these control variables come into play on this versus just turning something on and leaving it on until someone turns it off 
So machine control, you know, is, is, is pretty basic. And I would tell you that the process control is a little bit more advanced is what we're really looking at here. All right. So now when we get into the software, you know, what are we looking at with, with the software that we're going to be using? Um, oop, I lost my slide there. There we go. All right. As we look at the software, we've got two main software packages that we're going to we're going to concern ourselves about the most. Um, let's see here. Get back in here. There we go. Um, the first one being RS Links, and RS Links is used to configure used to configure the drivers to communicate with the PLC. Now that can be, um, you know, that could be a lot of different things, right? I have my PLC right here, and I know I need to talk to the PC, okay, to and from the PC. But I also know that in the future, we're going to start to study HMIs. I might need the PLC to talk to an HMI. I might need the PLC to talk to a variable frequency drive. I might need the PLC to talk to a machine vision system. Um, so it's not just, I mean, this is the most important one, right? This is the one we need first. Uh, if we can't talk to it with the PC, we can't set up the PLC to do anything, right? So we need to configure it to talk to the PC. And then we'll configure it to talk to the HMI, the Vision, the VFD, um, servos. You know, we've got servo drives. Um, we've got all kinds of different things that we may hook up to this thing. So that's that's our communication. You know, I, would, I would say that this is for comms. This gets us talking, okay? The RS Logics 500 software, on the other hand, is where we write PLC code. So when someone's wondering, you know, what's the difference between these two things, this is where we actually write the code, we compile the code, and when I say we compile the code, we verify the file. That's one of the things that we we like to, to do inside RS 500. And then, uh, and then we'll download, test, debug, um, put an N in there, download, test, debug. You know, we'll even use it for troubleshooting, right? We'll even troubleshoot inside of our Logix 500. So lots of different things that, that we can look at on that. Um, I'm gonna mention the key switch here for a second here. Um, you'll notice on the front of, of the, uh, if you, especially if you're using the RS uh, or the, the Slick 500, which is the one that we're gonna use in the lab. But even if you're using a micro, um, the Slick 500 has a key switch to do this. The MicroLogix, we can put it in these different modes, um, but really end up with, with three modes. You've got Run, you've got Program, and you've got Remote. Those are our three modes that you'll see inside of RSLogix 500 as well. In the Run mode, the PLC is executing PLC code. It executes code. That's what it does. I can't program it. I can't, you know, I can't, uh, can't manipulate it. It's executing the code. Programming, that's programming. So I'm not running. I'm going to write run with the not symbol. I am not running at this point, right? I am programming the code. And probably more often than anything, especially in the lab, what you're going to see more often than not is what we call remote mode. Because this allows us to control the mode via the software. So what I can do is I can program, I can download, and then I can switch it to run. And then when I want to go download or upload again, I can switch it to program. I don't have to physically change that key switch position. Now you might say, well, why even have the key switch? Why not just have it remote all the time? Well, there may be times out in the industry where, where we don't want the user or the people on the shop floor um, to be able to stop and start the, the controller. Um, it's in run mode. We have one person dedicated to that key because we don't want somebody that doesn't have the knowledge or maybe, you know, has a copy of the, the software. Maybe they're learning it in school right now. We don't want them manipulating the code in any way, shape, or form, thinking that they can do what they can do. Um, a lot of times at, a, at a, a big facility, you may have a, a team of controls engineers, and they're the only ones, you know, maybe just a handful of them that are, uh, are going to be allowed to make changes to the PLC code. We just don't want anybody to come in there and, and, and mess around with the code. Um, so anyways, beyond RS500 then, 
um, you know, and the 500 links and logics. Um, the most basic instructions that we're going to use in this class and the ones that you're going to use, you know, um, almost all the time. And I see I've got one uh, wrong here, so let me fix this real quick. It's uh, the one that says out. This should be output. It should be OTU. And we'll explain why here in a second. Um, so the first one is examine of close. And this always um, threw me off when I first saw these here. You know, I'm a relay logic guy coming from uh, nuclear submarines. It's, it's ex what it really means is examine a bit for an on condition. Um, this is equivalent to what we typically call in relay logic normally open. Okay. Examine if closed. So I'm going to, I'm going to look for a, an on condition. And when that condition is true, I'm going to close that bit. Okay. And then examine if open looks like this. You'll see the difference is this one's shown in a normal de-energized state. And this one is shown in a normal energized state. So we would call this normally closed. Now you can see why it'll mess you up here, right? Because it's examine if closed and we're calling it normally open and examine if open is normally closed. It's kind of the difference again between Alan Bradley's logic and what we would use in relay logic. Um, but for XIO, this is what we call examine a bit for an off condition, examine a bit for an open condition. And the reason why these work is what, what's happening is somewhere down the line, there's a switch wired up to a screw terminal, right? And if this switch is open, this bit is going to be closed. And up here, if this switch is open, you know, if, the, if I call this, uh, you know, the, the input up here, and this is the input down here, um, for an open condition, this one's going to be open. And for this one, for an open condition, this one's going to be closed. So examine if open. If it's open, then I'm going to energize the bit. So examine if closed, when it closes, that's when I'll close this. And examine if open is when it closes, it'll actually open. But when it's open, I will route power. So I realize that that's going to make it difficult for some of you guys the first time you see this, especially if you're used to this terminology. So you don't have to necessarily be uh, real keen on the XIC, XIO, as long as you understand what the symbols mean. That's probably the most important thing. And then output enable. You know, I would call this our coil. You know, if we were talking about uh, relay logic again, this is our coil or this is our output is what it is. Um, it does correspond to the screw terminal, but on, you know, where these were on the input side, this is on the output side. Now it's going to go somewhere and turn something on, right? Uh, output latch, a little bit different. It's got a little L inside of it. And output unlatch, it's got a little U inside of it. I treat these, if you've got some electronics back on, like a set and a reset. What that means is I don't have to maintain them. If you think about the output enable, the only time this screw terminal will turn on for output enable, OTE, is when that bit is energized. When that bit is energized, this output turns on. For the output latch, I don't have to maintain the bit energized. I can energize latch, it'll turn on. And then when I energize unlatch, it'll turn off. So it's kind of like a set, turn it on, and a reset. So I can work with momentary. Um, this works well with momentary inputs. Okay. And then the, the OSR, um, which looks like this, OSR. And this is what we call one-shot rising. And what that really means is I get, I get um, on the false to true condition. So when, it, when the input does this, okay, imagine you're turning a switch on right here, right? I'm turning a switch on, and the instant that that switch goes from zero up to a one, this is when I energize. And I energize for that one scan cycle, that one time on that zero to one transition, and then, and then I go away. It's kind of nice, imagine if you, maybe if you had a, a I don't know, a system on bit or a, you know, system start bit. And maybe when you started up a system on the first pulse, you want to reset all your timers and counts. Um, you could do that with it with an OSR. So on that first pulse of this thing turning on, I could set everything to a known state. So one shot rising is kind of a cool one as well. Um, I want to show you the, uh, the help menus here. It's like everything else in PLCs. 
probably one of the most important things to get good at um, with any software is understanding what they have out there for, for help menus. Um, so I'm just going to go in here and I'm going to type in RS Logics. Okay, and go into English. And RS Logics is going to open up. Now I'm not on Dunwoody's network right now, so it'll probably give me a, yeah, it'll give me the little uh, seven day trial period here. Once I get back on the network, I'll, it'll give me a key again. Um, but the neat thing about the software itself is there's a lot of help available to you, right? Um, first and foremost, you've got the help button here. If I go into the help button, I can go into the contents. You know, let's say I, I didn't know what it was I was looking for. Maybe I wanted to type in OSR and look at what that was. Um, you know, I could even search here if I wanted to OSR. Oh, no topics found. Let's see here. Let's do one shot. Now, well, nothing there, I guess. Um, contents and you can well you can see i'm kind of in a strange part of this here let's go back to the index well you know there again lots of stuff you can search search for to be honest with you though searching osr in there doesn't even make sense because this is a lot of the uh general software stuff what's even better than this is if you go into help and go to instruction help this is where i can for sure find my OSR. So if I want to find out how that OSR works, this is one of the coolest things about the Rockwell software is I can see all of the different instructions in here. So if I want to know what an OSR was, I could click on it and it would tell me exactly what an OSR is. Uh, conditional input instruction that triggers an event to occur one time. Uh, use an OSR when an event must be start based on the change of the status from false to true as triggered by like a push button, a zero to one, right? So that's kind of what we talked about there a minute ago. If I go back, I can go back and say, well, I wonder what, uh, you know, can I look up examine if, uh, examine if uh, closed or examine if open. Um, so let's go examine if closed. Uh, the instruction also called examine on or normally closed uh, functions as a, uh, as an input or a storage bit. Um, so, so I'm looking to see what this thing's going to look like. If I go back and I say examine if, uh, which one did I just do there? I must have done. There we go. Examine if open. I actually see something wrong in their in their in their instruction help here. Notice examine if open. Uh, they say examine off or normally closed. And if I go back and if I go to examine if closed, they say examine on or normally open. Okay, so that is that is right. So that was right. I thought I was clicking on the wrong one there for a second. Um, so you can see exactly how these different these different bits and these different instructions are used. If I want to know how an undelay timer worked. Um, I would go to TON. I can find out how it's addressed. I can find out what the different bit addresses are. I mean, tons and tons of information is available to you in the RS500 help file. So um, make sure, especially on that instruction help, I, I can't believe how good that that really is. Um, it's, it's absolutely outstanding. All right, so now we're going to do a, a, a real basic demo. Um, we talked about what links is for. RS links is where we configure our communication drivers. So we make everything, give everything the ability to talk. Um, RS 500, um, this is where we can set up the configuration of our PLC. We can do our programming, uh, address symbol table, lots of stuff. I'm gonna show you a few things. I'm not gonna get deep into this, but I do wanna show, especially for somebody that's, this is their first time programming a, a 500 series PLC, um, this will be good for you to see. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into RS Links. So I see RS Links Classic open up, and I now I right now have my PLC uh, plugged in, um, and I'm running with the Slick 500, waiting for RS Links to open up here. Uh, here we go. Um, so I'm running a Slick 500 right now. I'm hoping to get that guy talking to my PC here. Give him a few seconds. You know, while he's opening up, oh, there he goes, there he goes finally. Um, I find the easiest way, you know, step one of this is I wanna configure my drivers. So what I'm gonna do is there's a little button right here that says configure drivers. It's a little, little like uh, connection cord. I wanna make the two talk together. So I click on configure drivers and I see I got a couple of run in here. I got a port conflict, a few other things. I got a bunch of old stuff. So I'm gonna get I'm gonna get rid of all of these for right now. Pretend that I have none none available. All right, I have no drivers pre-set up. I'm gonna go in 
And right now, for this first time talking, I'm going to talk via RS-232 um, because I'm hooked up with an RS-232 cable. Um, later on, I can configure and make it talk via Ethernet. Um, you know, unfortunately, in this case, I don't have an Ethernet cable down here. And actually, I'm running a 504 processor. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add a new. And it's just going to give it a name. And you could name it whatever you want. I'm just going to let it be what it is, ABDF1. I hit OK. And this is one of the most important screens if you're talking RS-232. We want to verify, you know, that we're on a COM port. Um, but first and foremost, I'm talking to a slick. So I want to make sure that I select the slick micro panel view. This is the, the section of stuff I'm talking to. I could be talking to a compact logic or, um, you know, flex IO or something in, in the future. Who knows? Um, I'm going to do that. I think I've got a little RS-232 adapter, so I, I don't, I think it's going to show up on COM4, and it did. I've done this a few times now. You may have to mess around with COM, COM1 or COM2. Like if I go back to COM2 and I hit auto config, you'll see it didn't find it. If I go to COM3, it didn't find it. The good news is by the time you get to about COM6, you should have found it. And that auto config, you just say, yep, auto config successful. Now what that means is that means that I now have communications. Um, with the PLC that the RS links has established a communication with that PLC and you can actually See it right here under slick 504. So it's actually telling me. Hey, I see something out there um, And here's what it is um, Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open up RS logics again. RS links was only for you to Get the communication set up, but now RS logics Is where we're actually gonna do our programming um, So I'm gonna go into open up RS logics now and I typically will, I typically will just leave RS links kind of running down in the system tray. And then I'll go ahead and open up RS logics. Now, mind you, you can't do anything in RS logics until you've selected your hardware. So first thing I'm going to, and the reason being is how am I going to plug an input in? If I don't know how many input modules I have, how am I going to know what this PLC is capable of if I don't select the correct processor, right? So I'm going to go to new right up here in the top left. And when I go in here, it's going to say, hey, what processor are you running? Now, you can actually open up the door of your PLC. Sometimes if it's like a micro, you can look on the side of it. Um, a lot of times these will have a part number right on them. And I'm looking at mine right now, and I see it says 1747L541C. And it also says it's a 504 CPU on the front of my module right now. Um, give you an idea what I'm talking about here. Let's see if I can get into Google and type in 504 processor so a couple of things when you look at a 504 processor um, right across the front of it it actually says right across the front of it L you know slick 500 or uh, slick 504 CPU and if you open up this door on the inside of that door or if you if the module happens to be out you can get all the information off the side of the module but I'm not going to shut my PLC down to go look at that um, but a lot of times just opening this door you can look and see what the exact part number is. You'll also notice your key switch there, right? There's your uh, your remote, your program, and your run key switch. I guess I'm not going to wait for that to open up here. Well, maybe. Uh, it's not going to give me. Clicked enlarge. Didn't enlarge much. It's about the same as it was. But you'll see the uh, the run, remote, and program modes up on the, on the top of the PLC there based upon that key switch. All right. Go back into here. And so I know it's a 1747 L541C because I can open up the door and read that. I hit OK. Um, you can, now that only has selected the, the processor. I also know that I have a four slot rack on my PLC. So when, when I look at my, my rack of the PLC, what I'm actually seeing, close out some things here, is let's do five, SLC four slot rack. And we'll look at some images here. So this is what I have here, as I have a rack that looks like this. And what that means is I can plug in, this is probably the best image of it, I can actually plug in four individual units. The, fir the first one here is your power supply. Um, the first slot is gonna be your CPU. The second slot here will be my first IO module. Um, and then I can put three IO modules with a CPU on this particular one. So I've got a four slot rack. Um, why do I need to know that? Well, I need to know that because you'll notice one of the things here when I go to IO config is it says how many slots are in the rack. Um, I could have a rack that has four slots, seven slots, 10 slots, 13 slots. 
In my case, I have a four slot rack. Now for that first module, I could open up the door on that first module and I could find out that it's a, you know, 1747, you know, input module, you know, and the next one's a relay module, the next one's an analog module. What I love about the Allen Bradley software though, is if you click read IO config and you're on the right driver that I selected here and I hit read IO, it goes out and it finds them for you. So again, the 1746 IB16, I could have selected it from this list and, and used it. Uh, it would actually be 1746, uh, where are you at there? IB16, you know, and I could plug that in for each one, you know, whatever each one is. Uh, beauty is that read IO config though. Now that I've got comms, I can just go look at them all. Boom, here's what you got. I've got a DC input module, I've got a relay output module, and I've got an analog module. So I've got those all set up. This always kind of weirds me out. There is no like save or anything here. When you close it out, you're just set up, okay? Um, so now I've, I've done some stuff here. I've configured my drivers for links, I've selected my processor, I've done my IO configuration. Now I would tell you, I like to do what's called an address symbol table as well. Um, if you look in RS Logics and you go way down here, you have what's called the address symbol table. Um, this is a nice spot to designate what it is that you're you're going to be used. So if you know, for as an example, that you know I colon one slash zero is a start button. I'm actually going to look at mine here real quick. And sure enough, I colon one slash zero is a start button. What I'm going to do then is I'm going to go ahead and create a new record. And I'm going to call it I colon one slash zero. And for the symbol, I'm going to call that start underscore PB. Now the beauty of that is that anytime I go to use that symbol in my in my program, it's it's automatically going to uh, put the symbol or that that address. It's going to automatically put the symbol start PB on there. If I want to add a new record, because I know that I colon one slash one is my stop PB, I'll do that. And let's say I want to add I don't know what is what in here, so um, I'm sure. Well, we'll add a record for an output just to have it here. We'll do O colon uh, two slash zero. Um, so now I've got, and I think it's probably an LED or something that's wired up on my particular one here. Uh, I'm gonna call it LED. I, I don't know what color it is. I'm hoping it's a green underscore LED. But the beauty of this is, let's say, you know, I was programming a big, huge car wash and I've got the prints from the electricians and they're wiring up, you know, the, the floor switch um, that the wheel rolls into on your car as you pull in. They're wiring that up as I colon one slash zero. I'm going to put it in here so I don't accidentally program different than what's going to be wired up, right? I want, I want my symbol table and my wiring to match. Or in my case, if I do the symbol table first, then we'll generate a set of prints from my symbol table, or I can generate my symbol table from my prints. Now you might say, well, why does that matter? Well, here's the reason why. I can close out that symbol table now, right? And if I want to start programming, and I'm in here, and here's my, my, main, uh, my main view of my ladder. If I want to just go up here and pull in a new rung, I can just drag this new rung in until I get this little green arrow, and there's my new rung. If I want to throw in a, uh, a, uh, a couple bits, Examine if closed or normally open, whatever you want to call them there, and a coil. And let's say I wanted to run this on a start and a stop. What I could do here is I could just start writing stop. And notice what happens when I start writing stop. It already knows that that is I colon one slash one. I can just select it because it's in my symbol table. And you see what it did? It addressed it, it put the symbol on it, it's awesome. I can go in here and I can type in start, or I could even type in I colon one slash zero, and it's gonna give it the start. And if I go over here and type in O colon, let's do green, because we call it green. I'm gonna do green, oops, I'll do O colon. O colon two slash zero. There you see green LED. And so you can see exactly what, what I'm trying to bring up here. If you ever wanna bring in a branch run, I can do this. I can pull this back over. I can put a uh, a, a uh, examine of closed bit down here, and then then the neat thing about the Allen Bradley software is also I know I like this address O colon two zero as my holding contact. Well, I, I could type it in again, 
or I could type in green LED or, or I could even in the symbol table, I can pull up the symbol table and I can just drag that address right into here and I get the green LED. So if I'm not sure what it is I'm looking for, I can pull up the symbol table and just drag the one that is the IO. You might think, well, it's trivial when I have three IO points, right? It's not trivial when you have 300 IO points though, or 30 IO points for that matter. Um, it may be very helpful to keep tabs of those and know that I can just pull in whatever, whatever address it is I need and plug it into the system and know that it's gonna be good. All right, so now what I'm gonna do, let me go back to my slide here. We've talked about the, the address and symbol editor. Um, we've talked about IO config, program level comments. You know, these, these vary a lot from, from place to place, but you can also, you know, put comments on rungs. You can obviously put symbols on things. Um, I'm not going to do anything on this right now, but it's, it's never a bad idea to have some, uh, to have some comments at the top, you know, what revision it is, who wrote the code, what the purpose of the code is. Um, those are all good things to include in any comments that you might put in here, be it for program level comments or run comments. All right. Next thing, this is, this is an important part. Um, what I want to do now is I want to verify this file. So you'll, you'll notice this little verify file button up here. What this means is I'm, I'm verifying the, the active file that I'm programming in right now um, versus verifying a project which is going to be bigger in scope that we'll get into um, in future lectures here. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to verify the file. When I do that, you'll notice right down in the bottom left down here, you'll see verify is completed, no errors found. And you might say, well, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's create an error. Let's go ahead and go in here and just call it I1. Oh, it's, it's trying to be very helpful. And I'll just click away. There we go. So now I've got just I colon. I did a typo, something happened, something didn't go right, right? When I go to verify file, the nice thing about the verify file is if you have an error, you know, if you don't have an error, it just kind of says verify complete, no errors, and just hides down in the bottom corner. But if you ever have an error, it really tries to tell you what's going on. So much so that it says, hey, you have an error. It's in your program file. It's in file two. So right now this is called ladder two. You'll notice that if you look here, uh, system zero and system one, those are, those are uh, reserved. We can't edit those. So we're always gonna start on ladder two. That's gonna be for the first file that we start programming in. Um, but it says rung zero. So this is rung zero and it says insert three. I'm like, well, what's insert three? I got one, two, three, four. I got four things I've inserted. Well, first off, it got me to the right rung. Getting me to the right rung is probably good enough that I can find this. Let's say I couldn't find that though. Let's say I didn't see that as my problem. If I click on that, look what it does. When I click on that error, it actually is gonna highlight the thing that's wrong. So that's kind of nice. And so then I can say, oh, you know what? I didn't have an address on there. I wonder what I, what I was doing there. What was I thinking? And so I'll close this back out. I go to my address symbol table and I said, I know I want that to be the start push button. And I'm grabbing that address, throwing it in there from the symbol table. I go to verify file and everybody's happy now. So I think we're in a, we're in a pretty good spot now to, to actually download this thing. We've verified the file, um, save, download, test, debug. So as with any programming language, one of the things you wanna do or anything you do on a computer, I would tell you, not just programming, um, you always want to save and save often. So in this case, I'm going to do a file save as, and I typically am going to give this some sort of logical name. So I'm going to, it's, it's a trivial program. I'm going to call it green LED station underscore 001. And so what I've done is I've, I've basically have, have titled this in such a way, what is this thing for? You know, it's again, trivial project here, but you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, the, the car wash at the local gas station. So it's, you know, Bob's automotive car wash revision one. Uh, it's, you know, the traffic signal light, um, on the, the corner of highway 36 and century. So it's highway, you know, H H W Y 36 underscore century underscore, uh, traffic signal, you know, um, revision one, you know, whatever the case may be, but you want to save that. And you also want to create a file structure. I'm going to throw it on my desktop just because it's not something I'm going to keep, but I would, I would definitely recommend throwing that into a folder. Maybe I'll throw a folder on my desktop that says, uh, PLC programs. And so now I can hit open and then I can hit save. Now that's going to be saved. 
and now I'm in a good spot. You'll also know, notice that uh, you might have noticed a few minutes ago it was showing that this this wasn't named up here. It didn't say green LED station 001. Um, basically, it was an unsaved document trying to remind you, hey, you know, if you lose this or if your computer crashes, you could potentially lose all your work on this. Now, once you've saved it, the next step would be I want to download it. So I'm going to download this by clicking where it says offline and go to download. And, and I can make revision notes here as well, by the way. I can save it with a revision number, and I can also make revision notes. So if I've changed something, I can do that. I'm going to hit OK. It says it's downloading it. It's going into the PLC right now. And remember what we said, my PLC is in remote right now. So what that means is it's not, I don't have to go turn the key switch to run or program. It's going to cue me with some questions here. Do you want to go online? Yeah, I want to go online. So now it's saying, okay, you're good. Um, we are actually, let me take a look here. Oh. Online, I'm gonna go to run. So now it's asking me, do you wanna change your processor to run mode? Yep, I do. Cause I'm in remote, I can. Now one of the, the most common mistakes people make in programming a PLC is that they'll assume that this, this bit should be a normally closed bit. Um, they'll say, well, you know, that's a normally closed push button. That should be a normally closed bit. Um, in the world of relay logic, that makes perfect sense. But think of what's happening in your, in your PLC. What's actually happening in your PLC is um, if we look at these two inputs, so I colon one slash zero, if we look at them as inputs, I colon one slash zero. So that guy right now has 24 volts routed through a normally open push button, which is a start button. And then I colon one slash one is the one that I've got my stop button wired up to. I colon one slash one. And he's a normally closed push button wired up to I colon one slash one. So what that means is if I do these both as normally open bits or examine if closed, right now the normal position of that button means this is always on. Do you see that? And the normal position of that button means this one's always off. I don't have to draw this. Let me go back here real quick. I don't have to draw this bit as a normally closed bit because it's already on because the power is being routed to that screw terminal associated with I colon one slash one. So if I hit that button right now, I press it, it, it turns the bit off. You can see it not go green. I release it, it goes green again. So the normally closed button is always routing power. Versus the start button, this guy right here, which is normally open, if I press the normally open button, you'll see it goes green. By it going green, the green LED turns on way at the right there. And then the green LED becomes the holding contact to maintain the circuit on. So right now, the stop button is passing power. It's a logical one. The green LED is holding this on to keep the green LED on because the start button was only momentary. but if at this point I hit the stop button, you'll see the stop button will go turn off. And then when it comes back, I release it, you'll see the green will turn back on, but now your green LED is off. So on, right now I'm passing power all the way over the green LED. The green LED turns its holding contact on, release the start button, green LED stays on because of the holding contact. Hit stop, that removes power from the circuit, green LED turns off, and when I release stop, Stop becomes a logical one again. So in this remote run mode, we can actually see the status of the bits being zero or one based upon that green highlighting. Now there is a dangerous thing you can do. You can, uh, you can also do what's called enable forces. Um, I'm not a real big fan of it, but you can, by enabling forces, you can actually force a bit on. So if I wanna force on that, that LED, I've got forces installed and I go force on and force off. I can actually turn things on and off by installing forces here. So it's, it's a little bit dangerous. So if I toggle the bit or force it on, uh, come on now. I'm not sure why that guy's not going, not too important, but I, I'm not a real, real big fan of that. Um, first and foremost, uh, it's, it's nice like for remote troubleshooting, 
Um, but I'd, I'd say you're always in a safer condition if you're out flagging the bit, you know, um, versus just randomly forcing something. If you're if you're doing this remotely forcing, you better make sure that there's nobody near the machine. Um, in this case, we're trying a green LED. It's probably not the end of the world, um, but it could be a dangerous process. And again, when you see me force that on, you can see that it says the bit's on now. You can see what's happening there. That bit's on. Um, and I can even force the outputs on too. Now you can see the outputs on as well. So you just want to be really careful about that. Neat thing about this is you can actually uh, remove all the forces by just going up here, which is a nice way to go back to where you were from the beginning. So, all right. All right, let's keep going here. Uh, the four functions of a, uh, of a, of any IO module for that matter, um, would be number one, it's, it's a termination, meaning it provides a, a place to connect your field device. You know, so if we go back to the, to the, uh, the Google engine here and we type in 1746 IB16. I think that's what we were dealing with there. The one thing it'll provide right off the bat is it provides termination. So as the DC input module, you can see it provides a place for me to land that screw um, or that land that wire to make connection to the, to the PLC world. The second thing it provides is isolation. Um, we don't actually route the 24 volts DC that's coming in from your push button, let's say, it doesn't get routed out to the LED that I was just showing. Um, it is physically isolated. The inputs and outputs are physically isolated and the logic kind of lands in between them. Um, so I'll show you how that works here in a second. The other thing is it provides signal conditioning. And when we're talking about just, you know, push buttons, you know, it's turning a 24 volt DC signal into a one, a logical one, and it's turning a zero volt DC signal into a logical zero. Not too interesting when we're talking about digital values, but when we're talking about analog values, if I've got a potentiometer or a temperature sensor that's sending me, let's say, six volts, it's going to it's gonna give me a numerical value. Um, in the case of RS500, Uh, typically corresponds to uh, uh, a 0 to 32767 analog word. So that's that signal conditioning piece that's nice to get. And then the last thing it provides me is it provides me indication as well. So it provides me some sort of indication that things are working. So in the case of my digital input, I can look and see an LED that says, hey, I see your stop button's on, or I see your start button's on, or I see this output's on. Um, so a little bit about this, this, this DC input module stuff, you know, how does this work? Well, on every, on every DC input module, just as an example here, I've got an input, you know, we'll call this like in one or whatever, whatever screw terminal it is. Um, I have a common, um, and then the, the module also needs to be supplied with whatever voltage it is it needs to operate. So in this case, it'll be 24 volts. So this is where my, this is where that push button was going to wire up, right? I was going to bring 24 volts in and the push button was going to wire up to the screw terminal. Um, oh, and by the way, the common is going to be my return path back to some zero volt uh, spot, right? Um, in between there though, what I typically have is I have a, a resistor and I'll have a, an LED. Um, this is all internal to the module now. So this, this goes through what's called an, an opto isolator, an opto coupler, um, where on the other side of this, I'll have a phototransistor that's um, hooked up to some voltage here. And I, I'm simplifying this a little bit here, um, but this would then go to maybe a, uh, you know, another resistor here and uh, you know, some sort of indication. So we want some sort of indication on our, on our module that this is happening. And then this is going to go to the CPU as, as an input. But what you'll see is this part right here, this part that's inside here, this is what we call an optical isolation. What that means is it means it's not physically connected. The LED shines internally on this phototransistor. So when there's, when there's, um, when there's flow of electrons here, there's also going to be flow of electrons here. I'm, I'm always going to talk negative to positive for your sake there. 
Um, so that, that's an optical isolation of the module. And we can do the same thing with like a relay output module. If I, if I talk about the PLC CPU, the PLC CPU can send a signal and that signal will give me an, an indication as well that the output's gonna turn on where this is the, this is that the input is on. This is the indication right here. This little LED right here, that was my indication. That's uh, step four of this sequence. Um, I also have an indication on the output side and then I'll have a relay coil so this will be my relay coil if I was using a, a relay output module. And then I would have a, a contact associated with that relay that would switch when anytime that coil was on, that would trip. And what we're gonna do over here is on a relay output module, we have a connection called VAC, VDC. And then this guy here, I would call you know out one, just like I had input one, now I have output one. Um, and this might go to my you know, to whatever load I want, I want to supply whatever voltage AC or DC. And the thing about a relay module, it's a dry contact. So I can supply 120 volts to the load. I can supply 24 volts DC to the load. Even though the, the relay coil internal here is DC, this dry contact means I've got relay outputs that can do almost anything I want to do. Um, holding and latching instructions. A uh, little bit about holding and latching. What, what are these instructions? So from my page of notes here. We, we kind of mentioned this already when we did the demo here. When I talk about a holding contact in a ladder, if I have a ladder diagram and I have uh, input one and input two and I have a coil, I'll call it, I'm just going to call it output one or Q1. You know, and imagine I've got, uh, you know, wired up to, to input one is a, oops, uh, a push button, right? A push button like this. And wired up to input two is another push button, maybe normally closed. Um, so this is going to be I I one I'll make, and I'll make this one I two. I'm doing it backwards here. So I've got a normally open push button up here, and I got a normally closed push button down here. And then you know whatever my output is. Well, what I know is if I want this to be momentary push button, where this one's going to be on right away because it's normally closed. When I press this output's going to energize, but only as long as I'm pressing down on this button. As soon as I release it and it goes back the other way, it's going to de-energize. So if I want the output to stay on, what I need to do is I need to have a holding contact, a Q1, that's going to hold this, this bit on. And now when I press this, Q1 turns on, it turns on its associated holding bit. We call this a holding contact. We also sometimes call it a ceiling or, or a holding contact. I've, I've heard the term maintaining, holding, sealing. I've, I've heard, when I say sealing, I'm talking like S-E-A-L-I-N-G. Um, I've heard lots of different terms to define that, but what it means is when this turns on, it holds it. So even though this is momentary, I can turn it on and then I turn it off with the other one. Latch and unlatch are a different animal. I could do the same exact thing with latch and unlatch, but the way I would do that is now I would have, let's say a button and let's say that we have a, a normally open push button. I think we had that go into I2 before. Let's go back for a second. Yep, normally opens on I2 and with normally closed on I1. All right, so with latch and unlatch, what that means is if I have, let's say, um, I2, when I2 turns on, I do an output latch for Q1, and when when I1 goes the opposite direction, I, I unlatch. So this one's going to require this to be an examine if open, meaning if I did this examine if closed, a normally open bit, because this is a normally closed push button, it would always be unlatched. So now what's going to happen is when I press I, I2, I'm going to latch Q1. And normally, because this is on, this state's going to be open. So when I press it down and release it is when it's going to unlatch. So it doesn't, no holding contact required when I use latch and unlatch. No holding contact required. Now you'll notice um, on the last slide, I think I mentioned 
that the holding contact method, personal preference of mine is I prefer to do it with a holding contact versus doing it with latch and unlatch. And I'll tell you why. Um, there are some PLCs out there that um, use latch and unlatch, or even in like Siemens, they use set and reset. Um, there are some where set is dominant, reset is dominant. Um, and there are also some that where the, the latch and unlatch bit will survive a power cycle. What I like about the holding contact versus set and reset or latch and unlatch is it will never survive a power cycle. So I'm not wondering what's happening when I'm bringing power back up. I know it's gonna be back in its normal de-energized state. Um, I will tell you with RS500 and whatever revision we're on right now that if you cycle power, it doesn't stay latched. It will be unlatched and you'll have to re redo it. Um, but like I said before, there are some PLCs out there that I've seen where latch and unlatch or set and reset will survive a power cycle where just a holding contact would not survive a power cycle. So that's a little bit of a, in my mind, it's a little bit of a dangerous game to play, um, especially if you might be talking safety and such. So with that, that wraps up lesson two here, which was uh, basic, basic programming, uh, PLC programming instructions um, for the RS500 platform. And I'll see you, see you on the next lesson. Thanks.